and welcome to the uh, webinar brought to you by CDH and I'm Ryan Trenock from CDH, I'm one of the consultants here and uh, we're going to be looking at the Nintech situation and um, so glad you guys could make it here today. So um, I'm going to start with just some basic kind of who is CDH, what, what is our, who are we as a consulting firm, some of you may be familiar with us, some of you may not and, um, and then I'll get right into the meat of the material and end up with a nice little demo and take questions along the way. Sounds pretty good. Okay. So let's see here. Great. Okay. All right, CDH, we're a, we're a consulting company, and one of the major things we're looking at, we do like to do, is we listen hard. We want to develop solutions, but the best thing we want to do is develop a solution that's really, really pertinent and relevant. So we've seen a lot of, we've been around the industry for a really long time. Uh, we've been here 26, 26 years. We're based out of Grand Rapids. We've got 35 different staff members, and, and our approach is really kind of out of the box where we don't just go gather some requirements and then come back in three months and with some kind of product and go, oops, that's not exactly what you're doing. So our main tendencies, our kind of tenants, uh, core values is to listen hard and kind of listen what you guys are interested in doing and build partnerships um, with you to build solutions. So we're a Microsoft Gold partner, Nintex partner, Amazon Web Services, and a whole slew of others. All right, so you can see we've got a whole bunch of different pieces we've been awarded with. We've been around the industry for a really long time, and our expertise kind of falls into these five different major quadrants we're looking at. We have an infrastructure vein. We have a whole bunch of guys that are really there look to, to migrate your, provide infrastructure type of services from standing up a server to migrating you to the cloud, um, exchange, you name it. We have a collaboration group where we deal, that's where I'm from, we deal with SharePoint and the collaboration technologies, and those things kind of the surround that technology sphere altogether. Uh, we have an amazing user experience group. So these are folks that are uh, kind of the branders, the ones that come up with marketing information to, to take a site and make it look nice. And then also really leverage different web tools to then make sure users are going to the right place, using proper terms so that people use the right, right search things, they can find things and their experience is really, really good. And we found that it's not necessarily what you say, but it's, it's how you say it really becomes the matter. So we have a whole series of expertise, um, a core of about five guys that work on that. We also have a core set of development folks that just work on just traditional heavy lifting in the .NET or whatever platform is, space that's there to help build custom applications. And we got a project management team that leads a lot of our projects. All right, so if you're kind of looking at kind of a firm kind of scope with services, those are the kind of stuff we're looking at. Uh, if you want to contact us, you want to get fun and follow us, you can follow us up um, at our website at cdh.com, we're on Twitter, LinkedIn, and also on Facebook. Great. And uh, if you guys have questions along the way, feel free to, to chime in. I got Shannon here, our marketing marketing manager, to, and she'll forward questions along the way. I can't see them, so she's going to kind of forward them to me, excuse me, as we go. So, um, so without further ado, let's get rolling. All right. The Nintex workflow situation. That's me, all right, and Ryan. Okay, and just a little background on me. I I'm a consultant here with CDH, but I, and uh, for 12 years I was a, a Microsoft technical trainer. So and I spent and I around 2007 when SharePoint went big and became Microsoft's fastest growing product. I kind of saw the writing on the walls. Like I better get on this thing. So that became my full time gig. Is just kind of learning, working with that platform. I was an independent consultant and also did training. And then for um, about four years I worked at Chrysler. Uh, Fiat, you know, FCA, and I was part of their SharePoint team in implementing um, an amazing SharePoint platform there and getting it adopted by end users and also part of the development team there that led um, use of business automation. And one of the major tools we used there was, was Nintex and the workflow platform. So some of my experience is coming from this very, very large enterprise type of implementation where we really got to see, take the marketing stuff that Nintex fed us and say, okay, how does this really work, right? And does this does it does it work, right? And is is automation really the key thing? And so that's kind of my perspective on this stuff. I like to be a, a really hands-on kind of a buyer when I look at a product 
So is this really worth it? Is this really kind of pay up, live up to its standards? And so I thought this presentation would be really good in that sense where, you know, I'm not from the text, you know, we're just a consultancy. And so um, you get some unbiased kind of no sales fluff built on it. But uh, and we'll, we'll have a look at this, all this material. So what's my agenda? So here's kind of some serious questions you might have about Nintex as a platform. Okay, so like number one, it just starting from the very bottom, well, what is process automation and, and do I really need it, right? So first off, you have to say, hey, let's go, let's go buy this thing. Well, uh, and your boss might say, well, what's, what need does that solve? So we're going to look at that thing particularly. So what is a process automation and is this tool the right fit for that? Next thing you kind of figure out is well who should buy who should build these workflows right you know the obvious answer is IT should well maybe not maybe your business users should so we're going to look at different scenarios that that could happen in and then we'll look at when it, when you have options for automation what are your tools what are the tools that are available to you and um, we'll look at the Nintex pricing model so I think that's super important okay and they really they've made some changes and that really kind of what maybe you might have passed on Nintex in times before but they've made uh, some major changes to their pricing model that I think allow people to kind of have the uh, some introductory kind of tastes to using it instead of such a huge price tag. And um, then we'll look at the basic the feature set. I'll do a little demo on it and take your questions along the way. All right, does anybody have any questions so far? Okay, we're gonna say no. <laughs> All right, here we go. All right, so what is process automation and do I need it? All right, so. There's about three major things that happen whenever you start looking at some kind of process and automating it. Okay, we automate it for a couple of reasons. Number one is you're trying to save time, all right? And so that means some process you're doing it takes you know x amount of time. You want to take that time and you want to shorten it. So a great illustration is the printing press. You know, so uh, during the you know Renaissance time, they would hand write out books if they had to have a copy. It was a very, very labor-intensive type of thing. So let's make a printing press. Boom, boom, boom. Let's automate this process, speeding up time. And then that became a revolution unto its own. Some say that's the biggest revolution that ever happened in technology was the inventing of the printing press. So and it was such a time saver and leisure time that people began to have. All right. The second thing it does is increase accuracy. Okay, so whenever you have some kind of process, it'll then it'll take it from being randomized results. Okay, now you can have increased accuracy to having this is what happens every single time. Okay, so for example, uh, we did a workflow and a project for um, a plant, a man, um, it was a it was an assembly plant for Chrysler, and they have. They have a, the assembly line. They have like a particular station, and a station they let's say they put bumpers on a car, okay? And so at that station, they're going to need a couple of things. They're going to need um, so like a drop cable for network. They're going to need electricity because they have monitors there. They're going to need like an air gun, like an air hose for an air gun. I don't know. I'm just kind of making stuff up, right? And they need all of these kind of like, you know, what I call infrastructure components to make that station work. But the guys who work the station, they, will, they, they kind of have the best knowledge of it. They'll have the most ideas about how to improve it. So they go, hey, I got an idea. Let's move this thing over here and this thing there. And we should have this new electronic funky thing, go press your foot, and it goes all these fun things. And you're like, yeah, it's a great idea. Okay, well now, how do they then take all these teams and get them to now move all those parts around on that station, right? So they had a process. And, and they did this via email and spreadsheets. And, and they would get people to here, pitch the idea, get the different teams that are the network team, the, the pipe fitters, the electricians, and the plumbers. They get them all in one room, try to decide it. And then they would say, let's go out and do this. And, and, and sure, it was a great. They, they were able to make improvements to their process, to the actual what they're manufacturing of vehicles. But every time they did it, they would have different kinds of results. It would take certain different amounts of time. They would have. Sometimes certain some teams would get notified. Other teams were like, "Why well, I wasn't notified that you guys were going to do that. That really messed us up. And so we built a workflow that always included the exact same people, and they always got notified. They all had to sign off on it, so everybody was notified, and everybody moved all together. It not only increased the accuracy on that, but by increasing the accuracy, it was able to make the changes to their assembly line even faster. And that even saved, that saved the company millions of dollars over a span of like three years because now they're not having to make have damages happen to vehicles. 
So it was uh, to decrease quality problems with vehicles. So that's one other thing. So number one was save time. Number two, increase your accuracy. Here's the third thing is tacit knowledge. Okay, transfer tacit knowledge. And I don't know if you guys recognize this boat. This is the Holokiai. I think I'm saying it wrong. But this is a sailing vessel that's based out of Hawaii. And um, it, it sails without any instruments. There is no navigational instruments whatsoever. They use a, an ancient technique of only using stars, okay, and just sighting them with the naked eye to then traverse. And this boat went around the world just using that technique. Now, how would you guys would say that knowledge is easy to transfer? Nobody. Okay, nobody. So that's what call, that's what tacit knowledge is called. It's called knowledge that's hard to transfer. I mean, somehow they just inherently know this is where you go, and if that server needs to be rebooted, oh yeah, you have to hold the power plug out just halfway, then press the restart button. So there's this information that's very difficult, hard to transfer on. And so with an aging workforce, that becomes a major problem. So what workflows do? They help us get that knowledge into a very public space. Okay, get it documented and get it agreed upon, and it forces that unearthing of here's how we actually do that. Let's put that down now on paper, and then it becomes a repeatable thing. So those are the three things that make it why you should automate in the first place. Save time, increase your accuracy, and transfer tacit knowledge. All right, so any questions so far on that piece? Just shake your head. I know I can see you. No, I can't, but it's good to just pretend. <laughs> it makes us feel like a little more connected, doesn't it? Yes, it does. <laughs> All right. But then, at the same time, some things should not be automated. Okay? So, for example, this is a great picture. you got this family here. We're cooking dinner. All right? And so, we got Johnny that's over here. And I'm going to see if I'm going to start. I'm going to see if I can draw on this and you guys can see. Oh. I got to... That won't work. So you got Johnny, the guy with the tomato. You got you got Lucy with the carrots. You got mom and dad. Okay. So when they go ahead and they collaborate and how they're going to make dinner, is it always the same process? No. They probably change jobs, change roles. They probably make lots of ad hoc decisions on the fly, right then and there. And, and processes like that, as soon as you begin to automate them, those automations then actually become obstacles. Hey, this is less like your system, dude. It's a big obstacle. It's a big pain. So that's what can happen is that oftentimes, and my advice to folks is, okay, tell me about what you do. And we just listen, we listen, and I'm like, okay, let's not automate that. Okay? So, for example, I was at um, a small manufacturing company over the summer, and they, they make powdered milk. Okay, it's a family-run business. It's got a staff of about 14 kind of salary kind of people. And if they have to have a, a new policy within the plant, they all agree upon it. I go, well, tell me how does this work? Well, we get into a room on a weekly manager's meeting, and we talk it over. If we all agree, it's approved. If we don't agree, it's not approved. Okay, so how about we build the system that everybody's going to log in their email and then sign off on all these tasks afterwards? So that would be an obstacle. That would be that would be adding more activities to what they already do, right? So they just they just need some one person to say, boom, that document's approved. They don't need 14 people to log in the email, sign off on individual tasks. So that was a great example of let's not let's not automate that. And the key things for me is is there a clear does this process have a clear successful path that you can tell me quickly? If you can't tell me quickly. It's so randomized results and things that maybe we shouldn't automate it, right? And there has to be an ROI. There has to be a payoff or a turn on your investment for automating this guy. Great. All right, so then not everything should be automated, but the next thing you want to think about is, well, who should build these things, okay? Let's say you're now convinced, I want to have process automation. I really want to automate this. I really like to use some kind of workflow. I really like to use that in the context of SharePoint. So what are my options for building this stuff? Well, in order to build this, you have to know a couple of things. And I got them listed up here. Number one, you're going to have to know something about what the process is. What's the business process? Number two, you got to know a little bit about the software platform you're using. And then you actually have to know the tool, the workflow tool that you're using. All right, so the first people that could do that would be IT, okay? IT, you let the business keep doing businessy things, all right? If you have a chemical engineer that you're paying chemical engineer kind of salaries, you don't want them pulled off to then learn SharePoint, learn a workflow tool, and 
The only thing they may know out of those three things is just their business process. But now we're taking a chemical engineer and we're training them to do IT things. Sometimes it's much better to let business people do business things and IT people do IT things. So but that mat that's a matter of scale. You have to have staff that can support that. So that becomes then, well, if we make this decision, then becomes there comes a staffing question that comes afterwards. See how that works? Great. So but then who else could do it? Well, we could do the opposite end of the spectrum. We could do the end users. Okay? Those closest know the mostest is the way I would say that, right? Those that are on the work site, they know what the process is, and if we give people easy enough tools, and if they know, you know, they're pretty tech savvy, and we have a, a very enlightened end user population, then they could quickly create processes and change them as they organically and kind of evaluate and get bigger and better over the time. So that's the next kind of piece of the puzzle. Hey, welcome. Is that you can have end users start building them. All right, the other piece of the puzzle you could do is I've seen this in large organizations also. Is we're talking about who who builds workflows. Okay, is that you can actually have IT people that kind of live and breathe with the business folks. Okay, they're, they're not necessarily they're kind of the pseudo. Are you part of IT or are you part of marketing? Or are you part of HR? I'm not really sure. I go to marketing's picnics and IT's picnics, summer picnics. I'm kind of both, right? They have an IT skill set, but they're there. They're kind of like the, the person right next to you, right, that sits with that department and kind of caters to their, what I call, everyday kind of IT kind of needs. So they're the business analysts, but they still have this unique skill set, but they're, in this case, we have a journalist and a soldier, but this journalist is also kind of doing, kind of doing journalism, but he's also doing a little bit of soldiering at the same time. So the, that's one kind of scenario, another kind of scenario that could work out, all right? And then lastly I have here is you have just the IT, who needs them? <laughs> okay, these are the people that are off grid all the way, right? They just don't, very similar, like I have like the people that are on site, is they don't, I just got all the tools I need, I don't even call IT when I, I just, they're out of my, I want to stay out of their way, they're going to stay out of my way, and we're just going to build this nice little platform off grid as much as possible. And so, that's another type of scenario or users that could use this. All right, so I'm curious to know um, what kind of scenario, if you were to implement a workflow solution right now, who would build them? IT, end users, maybe a hybrid approach, a little kind of the embedded IT, uh, or something like that. Let's go to the chat window and see what you guys say. What do you guys say? Yeah, we have in, we got a couple. We got two guys here in the room with me, and Joe says it's a hybrid. What's your name? Clinton. Clinton. Hi, Ryan. Hi. Yeah. So, if we're to implement workflows at your organization, who would build them? Would it be an IT organization or a business? Uh, it would be me. I have to push the IT. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So there's this there's this little bit of a tension, and I think this is not always a clear cut decision. Right, and um, it depends on who you talk to. The business people are like, well, I want my people to build build it so they can change it. I don't want to have to do with IT because they're it's going to take really slow, or it's a budget thing. Every time I engage them, I got to pay. So it really depends culturally, depending on organization. Shannon, any feedback from the online? All right, okay. So let's move on. Well, we the main key here, folks, is we don't want to end up with this. This is a f the goal to avoid. Not that I've ever built something like that myself, but okay, you want to avoid situations like this where you have a process and someone creates another process that overlaps and destroys somebody else's process. But this is the key item to avoid right there. All right, so then we looked at, okay, we should probably automate. The next thing to ask is, well, who should be doing them, next is what are my options when it comes to SharePoint and the context in that platform. So here's what we have. Number one, Microsoft gives you an out-of-the-box tool to make custom workflows called SharePoint Designer. Okay, That's a really, really nice tool. Okay, And SharePoint Designer does many things besides just workflow. It allows you to build lists and libraries and a whole site from the ground up. You get the web editor. Uh, once upon a time, this it had a different name called Front Page. Ooh. Now I. I know you hate it just like I hate it when people do the I, technology. Remember when we had the Commod Commodore 64s? And it's like, okay, enough. So I won't go nostalgia on you. But SharePoint Designer is really uh, an HTML editor, okay? It has been really gauged up to 
build and customize a particular kind of website called the SharePoint site. And one of the key pieces of the puzzle in there, it's got a workflow editor. So you can kind of, you can get this pretty far, but it definitely has a limitation, okay? Microsoft, you might have seen, they're really into building a platform and then letting third-party companies build kind of the external tools that will rest on top of it to give you extended capabilities. And SharePoint is a great example of that. Um, there's a company called uh, Lightning Tools that built a BDC Metaman that gave us a user interface for something we could only do in code, okay, to connect SharePoint to, let's say, SQL Server Systems or Microsoft Dynamics. And so that was a great example, and SharePoint Designer takes it so far, and they kind of left it open for vendors. So what kind of uh, the other solution here, I'll talk about the vendors in a minute. Another solution is you can just use .NET. So the .NET platform, SharePoint's built on that, so you can use code. But that's pretty, that's going to be a, a long time to develop and code, code that element and debug it. And then Nintex plays into this space, okay? And they create a graphical user interface that actually is embedded right through the browser. And I'll get a chance to show that to you. So there's no extra software that's needed for the end user himself. It's an installation that happens on the server side and gets pushed out to people's browsers. So once it gets enabled for your site, really off and running. Okay, so that's really nice, and it's kind of an end user type of tool. And um, I'll talk about some of the differences between SharePoint Designer and Nintext in a minute. And now the other kind of major competitor out there that's out there in the landscape is K2. So K2 is another organization, another company. They make a product that's very similar to Nintext in its scale. Um, where they have a kind of a graphic or a graphical interface for building these, and they have kind of their pluses and minuses too. So when you kind of look at the, the big scape landscape for building workflows in a SharePoint platform, these are some of the big guys, okay? I'm sure there's other companies that exist. Uh, I'm not mentioning them, but, but this is, gives you kind of a, a where it sits. All right. So one of the things that I think I wanted to really bring, I thought this was really a, a good time to talk about Nintex, is that they've changed, they've been around for a while actually, okay? They've been around since, you know, 2008-ish, somewhere time frame. When SharePoint got big, they kind of just said, hey, let's go build some the tool that can help automate some of these workflows. And for the longest time, their price, price, pricing model was on a ser per server basis, okay? So we're talking thousands of dollars for, per web front end. That means if you have a, Two web front end IS servers, we're talking maybe $40,000, okay, for a yearly license, and then there's a support agreement on top of that, okay? But they've just changed the pricing model to make it so that it's not just this huge sticker shock right at the beginning, and if this is something you want to kind of wade into a little, a little smaller with a smaller price tag to have it. So I brought in a buddy of mine. You ready to roll? Yeah. Okay. I brought in a buddy of mine, Matt Malachewski. Right here, I'll give it to you. And he's going to talk you through some of the pricing pieces. And he's one of our sales guys, kind of our account executives. And, and he, he's done a lot of work with Nintext. So I thought I'd just pass over to the expert. Okay? So I'm going to pass the mic over. Great. I hope everybody can hear me. And uh, if you can, certainly let me know or put some uh, indication in the chat box. Uh, Nintex has evolved as it has gone to uh, the Office 365 model. They have a lot of different clients who are on-prem. We're also thinking about going to Office 365 as well sometime down the future. So they have recently started something called a consumption model. So the consumption model is a tiered pricing. So it's more of an operating ex cost instead of a capital expense. So the way that it's priced out, uh, they have two different types of licenses. We're not really going to go into the difference on that, but we certainly can have a conversation around that at a later date called standard as well as enterprise. And obviously, you get more feature functionality with the enterprise piece. But they price it out that you could buy workflows in blocks of five, and there's a yearly cost to it as well. So just like your Office 365 where you have a, a cost per uh, per user, Nintex is going with a consumption model, so when you when you go to your finance department, if you go into budgeting, it's not a capital expense. You can actually equate it to the actual workflow that you have. So their ROI is a little bit easier to calculate as well. So on average, just to kind of give you, you an idea, uh, the minimum purchase is five workflows, and that cost is $10,000 a year. The great thing about that, that's for the standard cost. So it's roughly about $2,000 per workflow. So um, that would be an ongoing cost, but what that does is allows you to equate that cost out to the actual workflow of what you did. So if it's an employee leave, 
maybe if it's an onboarding scenario, maybe it's a, a, you know any other type of workflow or capital expenditure workflow, you actually can have a price tag that goes to what that workflow is. So that development cost, you can take a look at it that compared to say maybe having a .NET developer who's actually you know kind of building an application, you can say okay this tool is going to for this workflow it's going to be two thousand roughly two thousand dollars just to build this workflow on an ongoing basis. The nice thing about this as well is uh, Nintex has done some studies, so when you compare and contrast the, the speed of a developer, what they, how they can develop in Nintex compared to how they can develop in, say, .NET, uh, it is relatively a, a four to one type of, uh, four times faster than uh, .NET. So that ability to drag and drop, and, and Ryan's going to be showing us, um, it's obviously a lot lot quicker. So there's a little bit about the pricing model. You obviously still can go with that uh, on-premise server pricing, but the way that they have done this pricing, you can start in on-prem right now and then move to Office 365 and you can pick up and move those workflows right into Office 365 at that time. So it's so kind of bridging that gap. It allows you to kind of start off the way that you want to and obviously as you grow, they have they give you price breaks based upon how many workflows that you have. So the more that you have, they'll give you a little bit more of a discount on those as well. So I, I, just a quick explanation. More than happy to go in more detail later on if anybody has questions, and Brian will pass along my contact information. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. So. The way I, way I see it is just to either have it per piece, you go to the hardware store, you buy individual nuts and bolts, or you can buy it on a per server basis, like going to the drive-in movie and as many as people as you can fit in the car, you're, buying, you're paying for the car. <laughs> okay, So that's the setup. So there are a lot of neat benefits, and I found that really great. Instead of just, just having it on a server, which can be a huge capital expense, like Matt said, you can have it much tied directly to, oh, well, it's two workflows for marketing and three workflows for HR. It can be a much more distributed type of cost model. There are two di two different editions that we have. We have standard and we have enterprise. And it has this gives you a good list. If we look on the left hand side here, of some of the other features that are available. And um, oops. we have connections. We have forms. There's a whole set of features. And I'm going to talk through some of these in a little bit. But these are pretty amazing type of feature sets and, and tells you what additions they come with. All right, let's keep moving on. All right, one of the other reasons I really want to kind of revisit Nintext, even though it's been around for a while, is that the tools have really began to amp up. Okay? Um, when, Share, when Nintext first released Workflow, it was really primarily like a SharePoint tool right, for automating activities inside SharePoint. Okay, but they're really beginning to expand this, and so, um, and they're able, I'll come back to the 61 in a second, they're really expanding it so that SharePoint can be the starting place, and with connections, connect to other platforms and other types of software type of components within your environment and outside of your environment. So we're talking about these guys. So you can have a workflow, for example, you go into SharePoint, someone fills out a new request, and it provisions an Amazon web service. You can pull information out of Bing, okay? Um, you can have it post things directly to Twitter or to Facebook, okay? Microsoft Dy Dynamics, and it can also be back and forth, okay? So um, you can upload a document into your document library, and then through a workflow, it can then copy that document and put it over in the Dropbox. Right? So these are this interoperability, to me it really is expanding the use and the use case scenarios for where Nintex kind of sits within your organization. And so what you see here represents a lot of places where manual IT work is currently happening. That's where I see this. So for example, Rackspace, they're a hosting company. And like, let's say that uh, someone puts a request, you need to spin up a new VM, it's what you host with Rackspace. So now that can be an automated workflow that gets out and spins up a VM for a span of, let's say, three hours while they do a test pilot on a particular software demonstration, okay? And then when you're done, it spins it back down. That's the kind of stuff that I think is incredibly exciting, and it takes the, the Nintex state kind of use case for out from just a, hey, I'm going to automate SharePoint stuff and approvals. It really now begins to move it into what I call like the the next tier of automation of activities. So it's pretty slick. All right. The other thing about it is that uh, compared to SharePoint Designer, 
there's 61 different, a different unique features or capabilities that Nintex gives us over SharePoint Designer and the out-of-the-box pieces of the puzzle. And you can see, obviously, some of this with connectors, which is connecting to some of these other kinds of platforms. And so those right there is, for me, the big kind of sell points, right? Especially if you deal interactively with those kind of organizations, then that, those are the kind of things that come to play. All right, another little tool that they have here is something, that, a new tool that they just released over the summer. Our feature is called Nintex Hawkeye. Okay, so um, a couple years ago, my wife and I, we bought a house we need, that needed to get renovated, okay? And so my wife's a carpenter, I, I'm an IT guy, and so what that means is I come to work, she works in the house, all right? And so like she does all the carpentry, plumbing, the whole business. So we're do, redoing the kitchen oh, a couple months ago, and we decided to put concrete counters, countertops in, all right? So it's supposed to be a one-day job, you mix the concrete, you pour it in, you go and do all this stuff, okay? Well. This was doing one day. So we started at 7 in the morning, and at 10 p.m., we're feeling like we're done, but then we noticed that the front edge, so this big, bad, kind of like countertops, it's right in the kitchen, was starting to sag out. And if it dries like that, that means the front edge of your countertop would be all saggy. Like, oh my gosh, what do we do? So when you're completely exhausted, what else do you do? You throw wood at it. We threw two by fours at it, did our best, and said, oh, this is, this is gonna be horrible. Well, they ended up drying that way, and over the next two weeks, my wife had to work on adding more cement, grinding and leveling, because it ended up being wonky at that point. And after two weeks of really, really like eight, ten hour days, we got them all ground down. They're beautiful. Okay. But the other day someone asked my wife, he says, Would you ever do the countertops, the concrete countertops again? And I go, Yeah, they're they're amazing. Right? They're just this handcrafted, amazing thing. And my wife's like, Are you kidding me? Never in my life. Okay, because it took so long. The process was so long, and if we think about we were really happy at the beginning, and we're really happy at the end, but during the middle was a whole lot of misery. And a lot of times, that's all we remember. We just remember how we started, or we remember how we ended, but we don't capture how things went along the way. Project management is kind of typical like this, right? They just know that you ended on time and under budget. Well, you don't know that you cut off five, you know, five major tasks or deliverables along the way, right? So there's this that that baselining concept, and here's what Hawkeye does. Hawkeye allows you guys to capture conditions at different points along the process. So you get automatic metrics gauging how long did this process take me to run, and what was the what was the status of everything along the way, right? So you get to the end, and says, man, this is beautiful concrete countertops. These are amazing. It's like a custom deal. You know, like, no, that was hell. Don't do that again, right? That, so that's the piece that's really missing. And so Nintex Hawkeye is this amazing analytic tools. It captures data. It uses Excel and Power BI. You can pull down. It's got pre-made dash charts, dashboard and charting on it. But you can use Power BI and then Excel charting to then pull up all different kinds of visualizations of that same kind of data. Now, I, and I like this because before this was up, I did this manually. We would, um, every time, like, let's say I, was, I did that, I gave you guys the example of the, um, the uh, assembly plant. So what we would do is we'd create, we would create our, own, our own logs, right? Whenever it started, we'd put an entry, process start, date time, current conditions. And every time we had, a, we had like seven approval steps, we would log when each step happened. So you know what the duration time is in between each one. Well, I don't have to build that manually anymore. They got this great new tool that does it. And by the way, if you if you go watch their video for Hawkeye, they, they have a guy from South Africa do it, and he says Hawkeye, the most with the best accent in the world. This is Nintex Hawkeye. <laughs> I don't know. For me, that was great. Let's say it again. Say it again. All right. So that's one of the feature sets that they have. It's pretty darn amazing. All right. So let's get into a little demo here, guys, and, and kind of now you've seen it. Uh, a good chance for you guys to see this and what's available and what's out there, all right? So I'm going to do a pretty, uh, I'd call it maybe a 100 level kind of demo, okay? Not really a robust one, but at the same time, it'll kind of give you the basics of, okay, is this a, you get a nature, feel for what the nature of the tool is, how do we build things, a basic speed of how this works, okay? And we'll open up the door, kind of peek down the hallway, well, how do we do the interactivity, interoperability to connectivity, all right? And so it'll be the scenario. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a basic PTO request and approval. Okay, someone go on vacation. 
All right, and notice this is a good thing to be automated. In our case and scenario, the guy who approves my PTO is, lives in Grand Rapids. He's not in my office. I can't walk up to him and say, hey, I'm going to be off on Friday. How's that sound? Great. No, I, I need to, there has to be a little more, there's a little more process along with it. All right, so that's your first thing. So let's go check this out. So let me stop the presentation and get out of this mode. And Nintex gives us, as a partner with them, they give us some uh, VMs that we can spin up on demand. Um, they have a lot of workflows pre-built so you can play around and see some examples. And so I got an example I just I actually scheduled. And so I'm going to give a chance. Let's go look at this guy. And so the, the setup we're going to look at here to start is this is an on-premise installation. That means SharePoint is in your servers, in your environment, okay? And we're looking at Nintex 2016. So this is the latest, greatest, all the power put into it. I, I've just automatically logged in as this guy named Richard, okay? And what you see here is a basic intranet. Okay, so intranet, accounting, HR, you have different zones for major departments within organization. Really nothing really crazy. So I'm gonna go over to the HR area. Okay, I'm just gonna build up a really, and I'm gonna have to take this guy just a little bit lower. It's going to get in the way a bunch. Okay, let's add a new quick little app. And the app is just a new list or a library. And we'll call it PTO. It's going to create a real simple list. Okay, there it is on the left-hand side. Let's pull it open. So for like a PTO request or a vacation request, Okay, what do we need to capture? We have basically first have to have like a real simple form for people to capture their wish list. And so it starts off automatically with a little title. Okay, well, how about we give them a chance to start off like a start date. This is when I want to go out, start my vacation. I also want to capture an end. Okay, let's give them an opportunity to have like a little description. We make it multiple lines of text. And how about we have a status field? We'll make it three possible choices. Now the status field represents kind of the stages of the outcomes of this. What we have in process, approved, and rejected. We could also have a, if there was a state for what it could be in, would be like deferred. Sure, we could do that. We'll do basic radio buttons. All right, so here's what it basically looks like. We'll see what it looks like to fill out a basic request. We we'll click this little new item button, and here's the out-of-the-box SharePoint form, web form generation. Right? And you're thinking, well, that's pretty darn awesome. <laughs> that's pretty good. You're right, okay? So we'll call this uh, going fishing. Okay, let's say it's Friday. Gone up north, fish. All right, and it's currently in process. Great, you fill out the form, you click save, and that's out of the box kind of things. Now one of the neat features that Nintex offers a part of its platform is not only just workflow, it offers what's called a form editing tool called Nintex Forms, okay? So like, well, what are we kind of looking at here? Okay, actually, let's do one more here. Um, I want to add one more field, because sometimes you might need to fill in who this is for. You fill it out, but it might be for somebody else, right? So we could have a who field. So one of the cool things we can do is Nintex Forms gives you the ability to now customize this interface. So if I go up to this little ribbon tab list, I got a button here. Since Nintex has been installed in the server platform, this button shows up. Okay, that guy right there. Okay, and check this out. I am now giving a form editing tool.
right? And the out of the box tool that allows you to, that Microsoft kind of compares this to is something called InfoPath, and Microsoft's been threatening for years to have that go away. Uh, it's still hanging around, and InfoPath's okay, all right, but it's a little clunky and has some drawbacks. And so this definitely extends the capabilities to what I call a, a pure web developer's type of toolbox. InfoPath can be used for like an interface for like a database. Okay, it uses a lot of XML behind the scenes, but this is very JavaScript, CSS type of kind of formatting to then make arrangements. So this is a drag and drop environment, and so I can, if I don't like this image, I can delete it. Okay, um, let's say I, filling out a title doesn't make much sense for a vacation request. It's just me, and this is when I want to go. I don't have to. Do I have to title my vacation? That doesn't make much sense. So we, how about we just remove that? label and this control. Uh, it gives all these nice little bot additional controls here. So let me grab a little label. Let's actually put a, a new label on this. And if I double click it, it's going to open up a, a properties control box. Way cool. This is what I want, like just static label text to show up. We'll say PTO request. It pops it in there. Notice I got these nice little resizing handles and I got I got a little typo there. Let's make this a little bit larger. Notice this feels like Microsoft Word. That's kind of the idea. Okay, PTO request. You also have the ability of then taking these controls and we can resize them and move them around. So notice this is very vertical in its stance, but maybe I want to have the end date right next to it. Pretty good stuff. Okay, like description, I'm going to take all that, move it up. Okay, and then one of the kind of the unique things that you're able to do here within Nintex is that if I pull up the settings, you can also do a right click and pull up the same settings box to double click. Like especially with the radio buttons, they traditionally go vertical. Okay, but sometimes on your your layout, you want things to be a little more horizontally spaced. And some of the cool things we're able to do with this is you're able to make tabs, you know, make panels and show and hide components. And remember, this is all just with either kind of drag and drop some functions, and even you can begin to add in JavaScript or jQuery to really accentuate it. So I'm going to say, hey, let's have these radio buttons instead of going vertically down. I want it to go horizontally, and I want it to be spanned across three columns. So if you look at this guy, notice they're now going horizontal instead of vertical. So that's it. It seems small, and this, but those things begin to matter, especially if you're trying to automate a process with existing forms and you have a very entrenched workforce that says, well, I want my form electronically to look like my paper form. Like, you got it, buddy. And now we can arrange that. We have a lot of flexibility to really change how these are going to be designed and be laid out. All right, there shouldn't be any need for an attachment. Let's get rid of that guy. Okay, and also status. We don't want the users to be able to change the status. So check this out. I can have it still visible, but let's just disable it. So the end users, they can't change the status. So that if it shows up approved or denied, they can always kind of see what's going on. All right, lastly, let's tidy this up, make it the right size, pull this up, we'll test it out. There we go. And it's got a nice little preview option. So without publishing it, without going live, I can have a quick little peek, see what it looks like, test out some of the code. All right, there's my form. PTO request, nice little image. Really kind of small, truncated, and I was able to change the arrangement. And I can also change colors and schemes, that kind of stuff. But I think you guys are getting the basic idea of it. So let's publish it and see if it actually works. So I'm taking going from hey, in my imagination, let's now make this a little live working form for that PTO request. I'm going to click OK. I'm going to close this down. And let's go see if it's a little, really for real. So if I click the new item button, instead of getting the out-of-the-box form, we now get the form I just designed. So pretty darn cool. Okay, let's say I'm going to go on vacation this day, this day. Uh, notice I can't change the in progress. Let's say this is for, uh, I got to remember who the fictitious users are, Jane Doe. 
Awesome. Looks good. Okay. Awesome. So one other part of the platform, a part of workflows, sometimes is this great feature that comes with Index called Nintex Forms. Okay? And we're just using it to customize the user experience. All right? Now that the data is in, now comes the time to do the processing. Okay? Think of this as like, kind of like a washing machine. Okay? Your form is the input, all right? and then it, goes, it takes the dirty clothes, puts it in the washing machine, and then it's going to go through an automated cycle to then have some kind of output at the end. So let's go build one of these guys. Okay? To build a new workflow, I'm going to go over to the list ribbon tab. I'm going to to this guy here called Workflow Settings. Now, SharePoint Designer is the only thing available to me. It'll show me I got two options here of Designer. But since Nintex is installed, notice it's just extending the, the, the normal construction path here. And I'm going to say, let's create a new workflow with Nintex Workflow. Instead of using the tool of SharePoint Designer, I now get the workflow design space. Cool. All right. And so, um, if you've seen Nintex before, the, the latest version here has gotten a, a big facelift in the look and feel of it, okay? And, and I like these, you got little headers here. These are all the different controls that can be used inside of it. And they're nice big targets, so single click, expand, single click, collapses. So you can find things pretty easily. In the previous version, they had a little plus sign. It was about that big that you had to hit. And I'm not, actually, the first thing I ever did was just turn off that left panel and then just start using what they call the Perl and started inserting from the shortcut menu. So uh, this is a huge improvement, especially for what I call the walk-up effect. means I've never seen this before. And if you just walk right up to it, if you were to guess, you could kind of guess. You take the things from the left and you drag them to the right, right? It makes that walk-up effect that much easier, okay? So here we go. So before we get to it, let me go through the workflow settings, okay? Workflow settings, this is the, the general, like if you have a baby, the first thing you do is give it a name, right? So we've got to give this thing a name. So we'll call this uh, PTO, PTO approval. And then you decide right here some really key things. What is going to be the triggering action to kick this thing off, right? If you think about a bull, okay, in the Spanish arena, what triggers it? I don't want to say red. Right? Okay? So we, all, we don't know that's, a, that's not true, but, but just this, they're just angry. <laughs> okay? So what triggers this process? So it can be when an item is first originally created. We can say yes. Okay? But we can also say, well, what if it's modified? Okay? So think about um, a different scenario, like a document. Um, let's say it's a standard operating procedure for uh, food contamination okay? at a manufacturing food plant. Okay? So if that process, if that document gets changed, then it probably should trigger the next or re-trigger the original approval process. Does that make sense? So we can have what's called, you know, on, on edit. But then you can also be conditional. Okay? So for example, we could say, so what if the dates change? Okay? On this request, then we should probably go to re-trigger the whole approval process. So when things get triggered, become a real big deal here. So for me, I'm just gonna keep it real simple. I'll just keep it as uh, when something's been created. But the conditions are really fun. Um, it's like, what was it before? What is it now? Are they the same? It's pretty fun. All right. Other things we could do is we can have a little shortcut menu be created. You can turn on verbose logging. That's great if your workflow was really big and suddenly errors. Okay. You can look at a really thick log on it. But this is the settings. I encourage people to just build that thing first and then start constructing this guy. All right. Now let's kind of let's, let's let's dive into this guy. Okay. So we got commonly used. And I also, here's a nice little tab here for Hawkeye. So Hawkeye uses this thing called a beacon. A beacon is where it, let's capture, capture data. Okay, we have a start, we have an end beacon. So if you think about the concrete countertops, we would have a start beacon at the beginning and then an end one, right? But then we would have put beacons along the middle to say, how are we feeling about this project now? And how about now? How about now? So a beacon is that report back into our a cube up in the sky in the cloud, so then you can extract data out of it. Super cool, super simple. Okay, we got some pre-made custom HR ones. See, they're customized. They put in, and check out the integration ones. Collect signatures through document. We have lists in libraries. 
So check in a document, check out. So these are pretty core SharePoint-y type of stuff. Copy, um, delete, um, move to another, another place, query a list to find out who's the approvers maybe, and then do something with that. Um, set permissions, there's a whole series of what I'll call very SharePoint-y kind of things. It's got, and this is where, where Nintex really kills SharePoint Designer and its capabilities is a lot of the logic and flow. The fact that it has loops, so you can loop through a series of records or documents, find the ones that aren't checked in, and check them all in. So that was one of the common problems with like a, a user, like if you have a user population that's not used to SharePoint and not used to the concept of check-in and check-out, one of the most common things they'll do is they'll forget the check-in documents. And it'll go into the weekend and people can't use them. So we used to set up this little workflow that would run on a schedule. Okay, 10 o'clock, Fridays, any document gets checked in automatically. In case you forgot, cleaning crew is going to come through and check it in for you. But that's a great example of a, of a workflow aiding and helping. It's kind of a little more of a utility kind of a tool. And so the platform really allowed us to do that, and it's a great logic and flow. Okay, let me go over to connections. So here's kind of the, the fun stuff you have. Amazon, so create an instance in Amazon, Amazon Web Services. If we look at Bing, get Bing directions. So you can have a workflow, reach out to Bing, get directions for a particular area, and, and feed those back into your process. Amazing, DocuSign, Dropbox, delete a document, download a document, query. These are very, very powerful. MailChimp, LinkedIn. And this is where we talked about earlier, is the taking Nintex and expanding its capabilities outside the world of SharePoint and now into what I call regular IT services. All right, so let's get into building. Now we kind of kind of previewed this. Enough preview, let's actually do it, okay? So the other cool thing I like is search. So you just type in. I just know it's either set, get, update. You know, you just kind of remember the key word. There's a lot of actions there. It can really throw things in there. So first thing I want to do is maybe change the workflow status to let people know it's working. And the way this works is, is you drag, I went a little too fast, is you drag a shape onto the pearl. That's what this little lighter thing is. And then if you double click the middle, it opens up a settings box, and then you configure it. Okay? Set the status. And how about we say, in progress. That way people know, hey, the workflow's been triggered. You know, like the, the light is on. You ever seen those dishwashers that are so quiet that they have to have lights, indicator lights on the front panel to let you know that it's running? No. <laughs> so, the, so the same thing. You want to know, give people visual indications that process is now going. Okay? So that was the set workflow status. And when it's done, how about we have a status that runs that it's, been, it's done complete? So these become kind of the, the starting and ending book thing, bookends of my process, all right? So the first thing I might want to do is send a little note, okay? And let's go to commonly used. How about we send a little confirmation to the person who filled it out that we received it? So I'll drag in this little send notification, and notice this is a different action, and it's going to have a different form with different attributes for me to fill out. Since it's a notification, well, who should it go? What's the subject? What's the body? So each one is going to be unique, all right? So who's this going to go to? And now I can type in someone's name. I can say Jane Doe, okay? It can check that person against Active Directory, but most of the time you may not know their name. And so, okay, Nintex gives you a great little tool. You can flip this open. You can search for people in the address book. But then you can also use a generic, a generic. So, for example, right here, when you look up, I can say, how about we go... How about we send this to whoever initiated the workflow? Whoever created it? Whoever submitted it? So notice here it says initiator. You know, like doctors, they don't use names of patients. They use the word the patient. Right? It's generic, so that's, that's how they're using it. So we're going to say subject. We'll say PTO uh, confirmation. Okay. Then we can have a little message here, and we can say um, your request has has been submitted and is in review. I, I am good at that. All right, but nothing, uh, emails are great if they have your name on it. So how about we have someone's name? And so this section becomes like mail merge where you then have static text and dynamic text built in. And let's say you submit a lot of PTO requests. 
So your request has been submitted. Your request has been submitted. And we can say uh, it has a start date. And we can kind of echo back to them a little information about what that looks like. And notice here I have the ability of all the item properties that they filled out. There's the start field. And I can also do end date. Insert reference and end. Awesome. Anytime we have kind of this dynamic space, you can do that kind of scenario where you're mixing text and um, data from the process itself, which I think is super fun. Okay, I'm going to say save. So it's now send notification. Okay, now if you have five emails that go out, they'll all say send notification. Each one of these, you guys can then customize the actual text that's on it. I can say uh, send confirmation to um, creator. All right, so now you're basically labeling or commenting your code as you go. All right, then the next piece, once we get that kind of notified, then um, how about we, how about we get, um, let's set this up for approval. Request approval. I'm going to drag that guy in. And this is super fun. Notice here it's got two paths of decline and approved. Okay, I mean, there's other kinds, you can have if statements, you can have switch statements, and then you get this nice visual representation of it. So I'm going to give it a little double click, it says, well, who's this going to go to? And for sake of uh, ease of demonstration, I'm currently logging to this guy named Richard. Okay, let's have it get approved back to me, so you can see both roles. There you go, underline means it's there. And be a little note here, please review the PTO request. There, I didn't type an extra P. I'll give it a little task name, PTO review. And then it also shows me some other tabs here, like, okay, there's actually going to be an email that's going to go to Richard. Here's kind of the sample email, and if I have time, we can customize it, put our own header and graphics and images into it. We could brand it, okay? Um, we'll save that. Okay, so he's going to get that notification. He's going to get an opportunity to record his accept, his thumbs up, kind of thumbs down, and then we program what happens if it goes on those different paths. Okay, so how about we update the status field? There you go. And we got set field value. That'll work. But I also like update item. Let's try a little bit more. Here we go. Set field allows you to set one field, but update item allows you to set multiple fields and the same item all at the same time. Okay? So I'll just another kind of illustration. So if it's declined, we want to basically say, hey, set it to reject it. Okay, so we can update, and notice here we can say for the current item, but we can pick other documents and items in here in our library or our site. Let's choose the status field, and what do we want it to be? And it's, we want it to be to reject it. Piece of cake. Same thing over here, let's set, change this item. This is we want to change, update the status. Want this to be auto approved. All right, so approved gets approved, decline gets declined. Looks really good. Okay. Now the last thing, if I were to keep this simple, we might want to send a little note to the initiator. Hey, here's the result of what the guy did. So I'm going to just copy this email just for the sake of time, and I love that you can take these different actions and you can copy and paste them. You can't do that in SharePoint Designer. You can't just take code and copy and paste if something's pretty close says your request, instead of your request has been submitted, you can say your request has been and how about we just fill in the status. Whatever the status has been set to, if those have been status been set to approved or declined, it'll have that right in the body of the email. Okay? And we'll say uh, results. And we can even put that in the body, in the subject matter of the email itself. Pretty cool. 
We'll say save. And there you go. Now this is a pretty simple workflow, all right? And I'll show you a couple of examples of a little bit larger kind of scaled ones that reach into much smaller things. But the idea here is to give you guys a basic idea. Here's what working inside a Nintex platform looks like, okay? And this is a matter of then taking those skills and the rolling them out a little bit further. It's kind of like once you figure out how to uh, pedal a bicycle, you know, like a tricycle, then you learn how to pedal a two-wheeler with, with training wheels and then a, uh, a kind of a BMX bike, a mountain bike, a road bike. You keep engaging it into a little bit larger kind of scale. All right, so publishing this workflow means makes it, makes it live, means it's going to be the real deal. Okay, and so it's going to town, it's taking the stuff, it's attaching a rig to the SharePoint list. And remember, we set this to trigger automatically. So as soon as the workflow, as soon as a, a new PTO request comes in, this should trigger automatically. So let's give that a shot. So I'll go with new item. Let's say I'm going to take off tomorrow. Uh, Getting sun. <laughs> Let's say this is for myself. Richard, I'll save it. And it saves, the, it saves it. Okay? Looks good. And I just refreshed it. And notice here is the new column here called PTL approval. That was the, that's the workflow. And notice it's in progress. In progress. Yep. So a question came to us through what's lazy, like what is lazy approval? Yeah, so I'll show you. I forgot to turn it on, but I'll show you where it would be used, okay? So it says in progress, and I love it that in the user interface, it tells people, hey, this thing's now in review, and we're looking at it. So um, if I look, let's pull up e our email. This is the email I got, okay? It says, I got my confirmation. Here's the confirmation email. It's got my name, your request has been submitted for review, and there's my start date, and there's my end date. That's for tomorrow. Oh, way cool. Okay, the other email I got, I also playing the role as the approver. Okay, it says here's what my request is. This was, we did customize this. This is just the out of the box one, and we could customize it even bigger. So let's now see what we could do to this. Now the question came in, what is lazy approval? Lazy approval will allow me to do this. Just reply to the email with a single word Yes, and if I don't want it, no. And so Nintex has a, a set of pre-canned keywords, but you can also add in your own words, okay? It could be like negative, affirmative, whatever your lingo is, right? And, and so that people can respond just to one word email for very simple processes. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, think about like processes that need, have, need to have electronic documentation. You are required by law to have an audit trail of who signed off on this stuff. If it's so easy to approve it, why, why go through the trouble of it? That's why. You need to provide an audit log of who signed off on it and when. And also, also if your, your workforce is geographically disparate, like you're not all in the same place, boom, a little, go through your phone, yes, done, no. Super easy. And once again, we don't want to be a burden. We want the system to enlighten and make things quicker. So that's what lazy approval does. It's pretty cool. Yep, the other question came in was mobile forms. Yep, so the Nintex can then, um, when you build the form, you can build it so that it's, you can have different versions of it, and you can also make it so it's automatically dynam dynamically scaling, okay? So if your platform is for an iPhone 6, it's going to be this particular scale or size, okay, resolutions. If you're going for an iPad, then it'll scale and then go for this. So a little bit larger size or if it's a desktop. So you can see how that'll look and then you can build your forms based on the present presentation of it. So the forms are designed to be interoperability amongst different hardware platform devices. Very cool. Let's get to approving this PTO so we can go on vacation tomorrow. This I got approved and denied, so we'll call it approved. You next got a place for a comment. Looks good. And notice you have a nice little opportunity to review the actual contents of the request itself. Okay, I'm gonna say okay. If we go over to PTO, the process is now complete, and the status is set to approved. Cool.
you know, and these are sometimes this takes a little bit for people to get their after heads around is that they have a this is the the process this is the outcome so if my uh, my 11 year old daughter comes up to me and says hey dad I completed the process of cleaning my room okay great let's let's go review this thing okay so we go up we look at it okay status is denied <laughs> okay you this is nowhere near clean but the process of review is now complete so those two things are not always the same Great. And I also mentioned just a nice audit. If I click on the PTO approval, come on. Let's refresh the page here. There it goes. And then it gives me the what happened. Well, this is the task is assigned to Richard Doe. He completed at this date, this time, and here's the outcome that is. And this is what's called the log, and we can write to this inside the workflow so we can capture any kind of workflow events inside of this log. So we have to provide audit kind of scenarios, and that's where that comes into play. All right, very cool. All right, so from beginning to end, you guys have seen two Nintex tools. So the form tool, very, very basic kind of form that I built, and then we're also seeing a workflow tool. We're now automating some kind of process. Once the data goes in, it then triggers a secondary process, and we're now kind of washing and kind of doing something with the data that's there. All right? That's kind of what I call a really a 101 kind of example. Let's go look at something else that might be a little more appetizing to you guys, okay? So, for example, let's head over. I'm in HR. Okay, and we have this, actually I'm going to go with the IT one, it's pretty slick. If I go to IT, we have a user creation request. So what we got here is I got a brand new guy, Barry White. Let's look at the form real quick. Let's say we have a brand new employee, you fill out some basic information, and then it's going to automatically create all their accounts in Active Directory. Provision a mailbox and, and, and link. Ooh, I know, I know. Now, now we're talking, okay? Now we can see the major stuff. So this is the form. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna demonstrate this. We're gonna, this is already pre-made, okay? And I tried running it earlier today. It's got a little bit of an error in it, so we can't, we can't take it. But we'll take it, we'll trigger it, and we'll take it as, so you can see it work as far as it'll go. But let's go look at the workflow, just to see how, what a larger scale one looks like. User provisioning automation. This is going to be amazing. Can you feel the excitement? It's building. All right, so here, here's what we got. This is what's called a multi-state workflow. Okay? Each one of these different separate columns, so here, 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 represents a different state. And you can switch between states because sometimes you can, uh, a real complicated process, it's not always linear. Step one, two, three. What if they reject? Then four. Well, we need to go back to two. And then what if they do it? Then we skip back up to five. You know, give overrides. So it's not always linear. And so Nintex created this great thing called a state machine so you can move and bounce between each one of these particular columns. If I click on the, and actually let's go to the edit the workflow so I can kind of examine some of this with us. These are the onboarding states. Okay, there they all are. Notice here I have handle error, and this is the starting one. And a good way of thinking about these, if you're pro if a programming background, these are like different subroutines or different functions. Okay, and you can call them by name at any time. Okay, so if there's any point there's an error, they'll get, always get rerouted to the handle error. So they all get handled generically, universally the same way. And so not only is this kind of like, it's a good tool, but it also, it's like a graphic way of programming and you use your programming expertise inside of this, right? So reusability, never repeat yourself, try not to copy and paste, that kind of stuff. So the first one goes into create AD. It says resolve, that makes sure you got a unique username and, ID, username and password. This is my given name, here's the surname, here's my domain, 
that's my output, it's actually you're gonna get this back. It's gonna store those into in variables, and it's gonna get used in the next piece, create ID, create AD user, and it's actually this is gonna connect to a certain area within the LDAP path. Domains Acme and local. Here's the username, password, and as here's what the accounts are. These are all different variables filling in that in, filling that in. Oops. There we go. It's pretty cool. It automatically generates automatically generate and store strong passwords. So I think that's really nice. Super fun. But you can see these are really, really fun things. It says, well then let's check, is there an error when we create inside AAD? If there is, yes. Okay. Then move them over here to the error error area. If not, continue on down this path. And it says go to the next stage, which is now once the account's created, let's add a particular group. I think I zoomed out a little bit. So it adds in certain departments, so now they have a certain AD group that they're associated with. And so it just keeps going. But this is a good example of a little bit larger scale um, automation of an IT manual process. Very cool. All right, let's get out of this. Let's see if we can see it in action. I want to see, I want to show you guys how, once your workflow start that's a little bit bigger, is there a way of tracking it very nicely? This right here is the, the trigger to start it. I'll say provision user. And this here, it gives me an overview of visually, oh, this is, this is all the stuff it's going to do. Da, da, da. Are you ready? I'm going to say yes, start. Now, there's something missing in here, I just because I haven't played with it myself, is that it'll eventually, it'll fail, okay, inside Active Directory. There's some kind of component in here that's missing in this virtual machine. But I will get a chance to show you it has an execution path. And it'll highlight any action that you saw in those square boxes that it completed, that it did. If they're green, that means it executed them. If it's yellow, that's where it's currently at. And if it's red, that's where it had an error. All right. So it's now running. Okay. It started and should be going. So if I go, how do you then look at this? If I go to advance and I go to workflow history, this will give us a list of a couple things. It'll tell us, okay, what workflows have been completed? Ah, oh, it did work. It did complete. Okay. And it ran at this point, and it looks like it completed right now. Oh, could not provision. There it is. Could not provision. It'll tell me if anything is currently running, if something's been canceled, and if something's been completed. So, for example, if my daughter comes up to me and says, Hi, Dad, I'm done cleaning my room, you know, and... Um, I'm all set. Yeah, I can go. I can watch TV now. I'm like, oh, how many how many times did you did you ask your mom, <laughs> right, <laughs> right? A little did I know the history. She's asked her and had that process fail ten times, right? So you can see the history of how many times a process has been ran. So let's have a look at this guy. So nine seven, and this is a little bit different view. We're not looking at design the workflow. We're looking at the history. What really happened? What actions did it really take place and do? There it is. And notice here, it shows us in green where it went. Boom. Boom. This guy, the Barry guy was in sales, so he got added to that Active Directory group. And I will really love how it gives you that very simple visual cue of this is the stuff that happened. It says, well, what step it went? Let's go enable the email. So was there an error in enabling the email? No. Nope. Let's go enable link. Was there an error? And there was a link in the OCS. So that's where it usually errors out. And so this is one way of looking at it, but we can also look at it in a, in a very textual log kind of format too. Okay, each step, when it start, when it end, and then you can even have even a shorter, here's kind of, it looks like an SSL certificate error we had going on. So pretty cool. 
I know. You guys are just super impressed by this. I can tell you're going to go home. You're going to tell all your, your whole family at the dinner table tonight about what you saw. And you're going to be like, you won't believe it. Okay? It's amazing. All right, I know. So we're IT guys. We have, to, we have to come up with something to talk about. Otherwise, people just roll their eyes every time. Right? At least we could fake it. So, but that's a good example of a, of a provisioning of a user right, from an IT side of things. And then they can just, you know, the examples get even bigger and bigger and bigger. And um, we've even found in some cases that workflows get too big, right? Um, and when you go to save it and publish it, it takes like three minutes of just processing. And in those cases, you make smaller workflows and you can call them by name. So it becomes, once again, that the, your background in programming comes into play without having to do all of the typing. You get this nice drag and drop interface and we're able to now begin to automate some major, major actions. Very cool. All right, so anybody have any questions about the demo I put together on so far? Um, Rebecca had a quick question. Mm -hmm. um, she had it a couple of minutes ago, and I missed it. She got disconnected and was wondering how the approval was handled, if it was just in your email account. No, great question. So you can have, for the approvals, you can have it happen, you can reply to the email itself, so that's called lazy approval, which is pretty awesome. Okay, that's a unique feature of Nintex that no other tool or product has. Okay, there it is. So I can reply to this email and just respond with a simple yes, simple no, approve, reject. Okay, in here you also have a link that'll take you right to an opportunity to approve the screen, approve the object itself. Okay, but I want to show you guys something, and this is the. This is my, I'm going to give you my personal flavor on this. You guys ready for my personal thing on this? Notice in this email, this is the PTL request. I got a link that takes me to the request itself, the actual object. Okay. Hey, I'm going to have fun. But notice I don't have any place to approve this right here. And by default, Nintex, and this is kind of a, a Microsoft thing, and Nintex decided to kind of play along with it, that we're going to, you have to go look at the object, and then when, in order to decide whether you approve it, you have to go someplace else. You either have to maybe go back to your email. And this is some of the, bit, the most feedback we had when we first implemented Nintex within Chrysler, is we just used these out-of-the-box forms. Like, oh, I mean, in order to sign off on this thing, where do I, where do I sign off on this? This document, or this, this item I'm looking at, I, I don't see an approve button. Well, dude, you've got to close this, and then you've got to go back to your email, and about then their eyes roll. What? You've got to be kidding me. Okay, and you got to click this little link right here, sir. It's like, what? Okay, so what we decided, what we ended up starting doing was, and this is Rebecca. This is where you'd be able to put, you know, people can click approve or reject. But what we ended up started doing was in the form itself. We would add a, a hidden panel that would show up right here, and we'd call approvals. Okay, I don't have a big button with the word approve, and I have another button here called reject, so they could look at the object, and then this this panel would only show up for the approvers. You can put security trimming on it, so based on security permissions, who the per current person is logging in on it, and then they would be able to look at the object and just approve and reject it all within the same screen. But if that was real, that's really pretty easy to do because we're using a web platform. We just use CSS, we, we give this a name, give it a tag, ID, you say hide, it hides and shows, and you put a little permission, permission. it's got a little function on it built into it, this is all part of Nintex Forms. So now you can begin to take the out of the box functionality, even to make it better. Question? Uh, can you have, if you have an intense form, can you have like repeating questions or anything like that? Yeah, sure can. So, The question was, and I'll, I'll repeat it, is if, what if you have an expense form? And I don't think they have that here. You got leave, new employee requests. Yeah, um, I could do it, but I thought I'd just I'll answer it really quickly, okay? So what you can have is like an expense form is you can have, and I'll just draw it, okay? Just man, this is like a, a whiteboard. If this is my main form, Okay, and it's an expense form. Then you might have like a here's I was on this is a date. Okay, date box. Um, here's what my here's my name. Uh, here's where I traveled to. 
All right? But then you're going to have a section where you need to start filling out an itemized list of receipts. Okay? And Intex Forms gives you a great way of doing that. You have what's called a repeating section where you control, okay, well, here is the basic um, amount, here's a description, and here's a category. Okay? And then you can say, give me a new Give me a new item. Okay, and as soon as you click new, these boxes then show up again, and you can fill out, okay, well, this is my mileage, this was my breakfast, and then you hit, hit new again, and then a whole other set of boxes then open up, and you can say, and then go to town. And then you can take all of the amounts, and then sum up at the end, and then submit it. So not only is it just you know, one kind of dimension, you can actually have a two different dimensions of data. And, and Intex gives you the ability that this can actually go to one, this right here could go to one list, and then this can go to a separate list because you know these line items might need to get approved separately. I have a different workflow that runs, and this is a different workflow that runs off of it. And so there's all this granular kind of control you can do. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. If you understand this, it is amazing. Okay, gone. <laughs> Yeah, huge. Yeah, huge. So um, you can make what are called workflow templates. So within an organization, if there's a, let's say, a three-level approval. So you can build that one time, okay? But then you can make that as a template that other people other within the entire company could then use. And then you just change, you just fill in who the names are, okay, for a three-level type of approval. So that's a great model is that in having kind of it controlled through IT, you can start beginning to assess what's the general needs of everybody and begin to consolidate those needs into reusable tools versus, versus if you uh, allow the end user population to build the workflows, they're, they're just going to build single solutions okay, that aren't reusable for other people because they're just there to solve their own particular needs themselves. So you can have them all stored in a central location and then reused throughout the entire environment. Very good. Good question. Cool. All right, I'll show you guys um, one other thing I'd like to just kind of give you a little preview on is that not only does workflows work inside of kind of an on-premise environment, it also works inside Office 365, okay? So this is a Office 365 tenant that we have and just something I've been playing around with, kind of like my own little sandbox. And what I have here is a, a real simple list of approvers, okay? And one of the problems that we often have instead of a kind of a SharePoint environment is that I want these guys, managers, to approve, okay? And I don't want, I still want to maintain control, the security, right? I, I, I want to be able to manage who's the appro who the approvers are, okay? And I don't want the end users to have to get into the backstage view and start controlling some of the security elements because if I give them the keys to all of the security of the site, then I've, I've compromised the whole site. So what we could set up is just a real simple list. They fill out, okay, here's our, you know, give it to an administrative assistant. They tell me who their managers are. Okay, let's say this is Tim. Okay, he's one of our managers. Okay, and then just start popping this list of who the approvers should be. Okay, and then I can have a workflow run, grab their names, and put them into security groups automatically for them. So that way I'm abstracting a lot of more technical details and allowing them, the end users kind of control who those users are. So pretty cool, and uh, Mark. So this is just a, a real simple list, and notice here the inter interface is a little bit different, and I got these have been apps that have been added to the platform. I have Nintex Forms, I, can, I think it's been used here on this, and then if I got Workflow, and the experience is a little bit different, so this is the, always the, braid, the largest, biggest, most best features we we'll always find in an online kind of scenario. Yeah. So it says, what do you want to do? So I got this great. It's really, I think the user interface here in the cloud is a little easier to kind of walk through than the on-premise stuff. This year, I want to create a new workflow. And I don't have to go through a ribbon and find stuff. It's really, they're really holding my hand to make this stuff. I want to make a brand new one, and it takes you right to the design interface. You know, it's really similar looking, isn't it? Okay, and so that's kind of the idea. And Matt made it's a, a huge, great comment that if you start on-prem, you build workflows, we can migrate those to the cloud later on. And it's the same platform. They've made it very, very homogeneous in that nature. All right? And so um, I'll just use a real simple action here. And 
Notice here I got Office 365 and add user to a group. I think that's a super great option. I, I, we don't have other places. So what is my destination site? I got some of this stuff kind of pre-canned for us. And notice here I have the, the controls or the variables are, that I pick from are on the right-hand side instead of on this lower section. Okay, so destination URL site, that's where I'm going to go. The user is, I get this out of the way. Manager, and then the group I'm going to put them in is engineering approvers. SharePoint, is, this is my MG. Yeah, so you can say, well, I can pick from variables that are already established, or I can reference other places within Office 65, other lists. Okay, so that's what we could do. Um, okay, now it's asking for my stuff. Because if you're going to push things to Office 365, it's going to make sure that, well, th does this workflow have elevator privileges to do it? No, you have to do some impersonation. And it's my real life password I got to put in there. Okay, I'm going to say save. All right, so I'm just going to do a real simple action just to kind of show the scenario. And let's publish this guy. So let's, let's set some settings on it. If you're not careful, you, when you first get started, you'll have like five workflows named new workflow. Okay, it's, it's going to happen. Okay, we'll say uh, add user to um, approvers group. And let's have it start automatically. Great, I'm going to publish it out. Notice the interface is a little bit different, but at the same time, we're using the same kind of bike riding kind of skill set. You know, it's really just, oh, apply it down to this other scenario, this pretty similar type of scenario. Blazing fast, blazing fast that we have here. Yeah. Okay, so it's been finished. Really simple kind of action here. Let's go through adding a new guy. Okay, let's enter a name. Let's go with Doug. All right, so it adds Doug in there, and okay. And if we go look at the security permissions on the site, we should find a group called Engineer Improvers, and Doug should be in there. Engineer Improvers. Well, it looks like it's still running, and there's Doug. So I think that's pretty awesome. You know, but that's just an example of getting a little kind of extending outside, uh, just a small scenario. You know, a lot of times end users don't want to handle a lot of technical stuff. But I can give them a list, and then the workflow can take over. And now it, this workflow has this kind of like magic wand to touch a lot of stuff, from Active Directory to Dropbox to controlling security. You you can really begin to kind of leave this interface out for people to use, and then begin to automate a whole lot of stuff. So pretty cool, and this is just a small, simple example of just in an Office 365 environment where we're using the same kind of tool set, just, um, just kind of changing names and places. Okay. All right, well, this is going to be, I'm going to bring my demos to an end here, and um, I just have a couple more slides to kind of finish up here. This slide, I just, I just ripped right off an of in-text, you know, um, and this is good whether you use an in-text or not. What are some of the processes out there that are pretty typical to be um, automated and kind of gives you a top five for each particular department? So you could zero in on your particular department. You can find, oh, okay, yeah, if I'm, I'm looking for like event planning and 
proposal creation, those kinds of things really, really begin to kind of make sense. And so that's where you begin to, if you start positioning, like I really want to use this tool, okay? You remember you want to, you always want to, you always if you want to approach this, you always want to have a good business case in mind, right? And think about, hey, I can make these processes faster, smoother, and more accurate, and then can then turn into more dollars. So that's a good case you can get that in front of your executive team. All right, so now I'll kind of move it up into any questions, um, comments, kind of feedback. So he has been popping them in along the way. Is there non profit pricing for NIFA? I don't think so. That would be awesome, though. So each one of those little part of it is two grand for each barrel. Yeah. So we can find out, though. I, I don't, they don't mention that necessarily in their pricing model, but if we can get your contact information. And, and government, does government and nonprofit have discount pricing for this stuff? Um, I think the tendency is that the answer is no, but we'll, we can get that double confirmed. Yeah, they, I'm pretty positive the answer is no, but from, sorry, you both are on the yeah. I'm pretty positive the answer is no, but I think the way that Nintex has gone ahead and has uh, the way that they've gone with the pricing model of the consumption model, if, if you're in the IT, and I think most of the people probably here are in the IT division, is that because it's based upon the per workflow situation, you can go to those other buckets of departments who, if it's HR that's looking for, you know, they want to build that, that build that workflow. Maybe it's the marketing team. If it's something we didn't really touch upon is um, uh, Nintex also can be integrated with your website, right? So maybe you have a lead come in. Maybe you have a, a, we have a, a, somebody from a college here. Maybe they have somebody who wants to fill out information on a website, right? And that's kind of more the marketing. You know, it's, they want somebody to go in there and you want that to kind of go through a workflow so it kind of goes to the right department who, who they have interest in. The way that they have this consumption model, though, it allows you to tie that specific workflow to a specific div division. So what that does is allow, because a lot of IT is, is more or less more of, you guys are the solution developers for a lot of these other departments that are out there. What this tool does is gives you the ability to say, okay, I want to build this workflow. It's $2,000 to do this, but, but think about what we're automating for that specific department that we have. It becomes an operating expense, and there's value that you do that with every single transaction that you have. So yes, there it, you can equate it to that $2,000 per workflow, and it gets better as you go along. But what that does is allows you to distribute that expense, not in the IT, is, is kind of a capital expenditure which you have in your budget. You can spread that cost all the way out. And as you buy workflows, you can say, okay, this is the plan what I have. The, the way that I operate with a lot of our clients, is saying, okay, give me give me one workflow that you guys have a use case for, right? Uh, we'll help you build that. Then the nice thing about this, I, I'm a sales guy, and I can build these workflows myself. I mean, I, I can do this demo. I can I can build it out. So it, it it takes some of that some of that development out of IT's hands, but you start like what SharePoint is supposed to do. It empowers users actually to create solutions, right? They they know their process is better than anybody else, more so than we do. So there's there's savings a because they're developing a little bit, uh, but then also there's that that BA role that they don't have to translate that to somebody else. They actually a nice thing that you can do is with that canvas, you can they can just kind of draw out the kind of the business process of what it's supposed to be, and then you might have an IT person who comes in and just kind of ties up the loose ends and maybe you know the kind of do those the SQL queries or how it needs to to go in. So there's a lot of use cases. So so I think and, and I, I understand it. Budgets are tight, right? You're, everybody's looking at the best way to spend their money. I would look at this as more okay. If this, if there's a, a a need for a solution, this this a need for there's a problem statement that they have. This should be a tool that you guys consider, you know, throwing out on the table. Hey, this 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 potentially can help out. You can use it in a wide variety of different platforms. So, but I will find out about the government pricing to see what see what we can can find out. There there may or may not be. So. And the licensing isn't clear. So the small workflow that you just showed, that you just created, count as one of the five workflows. Yes. It does. So um, this is a question I might be able to ha ha uh, answer. The way that Nintex works is it's 
per workflow basis, but they also, uh, if, it's, if it has multiple steps in that workflow, it still counts as one. You can have up to 50 actions per work, per individual workflow. So it gets it gets rather it gets rather complex the the way that it is. So, it, like I said, the goal is to get the value out of that. If it's a simple process that automates it, so you don't it a speeds time to market to get that solution done and passes the information to the right person, or you're just automating processes so people does not have to do anything. That's the value that you have. Simple or complex, they do have limitations around that, but um, obviously the value should be there. If it's something, if it's a user provisioning, or if it's just an employee leave, uh, that the value should be there and should be able to equate it to the per per right, usage Scott, price. You should be able to articulate it. Should be able to, you should be able to articulate the the workflow need is either going to be save time, accuracy, okay, or resolving of some kind of tacit information, right? Some kind of tacit process, you know. So those are those are coming big, big ticket items. So whether the workflow is small or big, it should solve one of those three things. So, but Matt brings up a good point. Um, is like, what what the CDH? What can we do with you guys to help you with your NinTech scenarios with that? So we offer kind of a, a couple of different services, and so I, Matt really touched on one is if you purchase, let's say, a block of ten, you know, we would be great. We'd love to come in and help you build the first two, right? And, and we do it together, right? And then the rest of them, you kind of like we pass off the torch to you. And now you've, we've transferred the knowledge of how you do it. We've enabled you, and we become more of your kind of like, kind of your big brother consultant kind of role, of saying, "Hey, that maybe that's not a good process to automate. This one is a little bit bigger of a, a return kind of a scenario because we've been there, been in the trenches, seen it implemented a, a, a dozens or hundreds of times, and, and we can walk you through those best practices. So that might be the first thing. The second thing is we can be your pure just infrastructure people, bring it in and install it and configure it." type of scenario, um, but anything from kind of soup to nuts when it comes to Nintex, we can help you guys in that kind of space. Cool. Questions? All right. Well, then I'm going to kind of bring this down for a landing, and I'll just like to say thank you guys so much for coming today and take your time out to learn a little bit about Nintex. Um, uh, get a chance to interact with you folks, get to know you a little bit better, develop a, a relationship even more. And we have a, we'd love to get some like official feedback from you folks. There's a link here on my presentation uh, out to SurveyMonkey, and it's just, uh, how many questions was it, Shannon? 13 questions, 13 quick questions. We'd love to get your feedback. You know, would you like, did you like this? Would you do it again? You know, um, yeah, whatever. You know, Ryan's breath was so bad I could smell it through the computer. I mean, whatever. You know, just whatever, whatever feedback, that'd be awesome. You guys could give us, it'd be great. So, all right. All my questions are right here. Oh, survey is, yeah. <laughs> Good feedback right away.